Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our May Extension Master Gardener webinar. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. We hope that you are all staying safe and well wherever you are dialing in from. Uh, before we start, please make sure that your microphone is muted for the duration of this session. Um, if you have any questions as we go through, please type them in the chat box. And then we will spend the last 10 to 15 minutes of our webinar having Mark address those questions. Um, since we are right at 10, I am excited to introduce Mark Sutphin this morning as our speaker. Mark is the Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension Agent in Frederick County. He will be talking to us about spotted lanternfly. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Kathleen. It's good to be with you this morning, and thanks everyone for joining in. Um, Spotted lanternfly has unfortunately um, become much of my life over the past few years, and uh, I often get introduced as Mr. Spotted Lanternfly. So um, if you hear me called that, that's, I guess, appropriate these days, as anywhere from 50 to 75% of my time seems to be spent with this insect um, anymore. But here is the insect on the front screen that I am sharing. This is the adult. It's a beautiful insect and um, it's really a shame that it's such a destructive pest. I'm trying to advance. There we go. Um, wanted to give credit certainly to Eric Day and Teresa Dellinger in the Virginia Tech Insect ID Lab. They, uh, the two of them have created many of these slides that we've been using across the state and, and really in the Mid-Atlantic region as, as we're presenting about this insect and certainly thank them for their great work and uh, all, all the many good things that they're doing in and around this insect. As you see behind me, um, if you can see my video, there is a pop-up banner. Devin and the State Master Gardener Office created that and wanted to also give credit and recognition to her and the State Master Gardener Office for, for their efforts in battling this new invasive insect. So the uh, curtain roll that Eric put in here now shows us the map of infestation for this, this invasive insect. Uh, the insect itself is native to Asia. Uh, it, it came from uh, China, we believe, uh, was the pathway to the United States, but native, native to China, Bangladesh, Vietnam, uh, Eastern India, and some other regions of Asia. In Asia itself, it has also been a pest in South Korea, uh, transported there for um, in the last decade and also in Japan. And it was in 2014 that it first showed up in the United States, right here in Berks County, Pennsylvania. And as you can see on this map since 2014, the areas of infestation shown in blue have expanded quite a bit. Um, Pennsylvania now has numerous counties quarantined. That area actually nearly doubled with 12 counties being added to their quarantine in the spring um, of this year, really from expansion last year. As you can see, there are counties of infestation in New Jersey, Delaware, and also Maryland. Those all basically came on board in 2018, shortly after the Virginia population was identified here in Winchester, Frederick County. Uh, I will note these two counties as outliers over towards Pittsburgh. Again, those were two of the 12 that were added this spring. And um, so that's basically a new population on the western side of Pennsylvania, just a few miles from, from the, the western panhandle, uh, northern panhandle there in West Virginia, and the eastern border with Ohio. Our population in Winchester, Frederick County, um, as you can see, uh, started here in 2000. 
18. I will show that on the next slide, but just wanted to point out there are two uh, counties now beside us in blue, Clark County to the east of Frederick. Clark is in Virginia. Uh, there were insects found there on the western side of Clark County from our population in Frederick. Also, the population from Frederick County has spread to the north into Berkeley County, West Virginia. Again, both of those counties uh, delineating positives in the fall of 2019. Those two counties have yet to declare quarantine. And um, we'll talk maybe a little bit about quarantine as, as we go along, but that officially refers to business, transport, and commercial, commercial entities. Uh, there is no official regulatory status uh, for individuals and homeowners, although we would ask certainly that best management practices to not transport this, this insect around uh, be adhered to, even, even for the individual. Um, so this is not a federally regulated insect pest, so each Department of Agriculture is the one that's actually declaring the quarantines in the state. And uh, so here in Virginia, that's all being done through Virginia Department of Ag and Consumer Services. And um, really a great team they have there dedicated to spotted lanternfly. So here we go with the initial detection, uh, January 10th, 2018, found here in Winchester, Frederick County. The city of Winchester uh, sits basically in the center of the county of Frederick and the population showed up on the north side of the city in, in the county limits and originally was determined to be in about a one square mile uh, area early 2018 by many egg mass visual surveys done by Virginia Department of Ag and also uh, some of us in extension helping out. And uh, really, really a small area that it was initially identified uh, to be located in. And unfortunately, since then, we have seen that area grow and expand, as I alluded to the north into West Virginia and to the east uh, into Clark County, to the point that from one square mile, now two years later, over two years later, we are over uh, 60 square miles of in known infestation area. Uh, we've seen a few intercepts in the southern part of the county. Really transportation intercepts is what those are believed to be. And this insect is just a great hitch hitchhiker at all life stages and, and another reason for some of the concern with this insect. Again, just showing uh, some of the great work that Virginia Department of Ag is doing, this is a screenshot of, of one of their maps and all of the, the checking and reporting and banding that they're doing to truly try to delineate and understand where this insect is. I'm not asking you to understand this map, um, but just trying to um, give credit really to Virginia Department of Ag in, in hand with USDA as well, United States Department of Ag. Um, APHIS is really the department they're working hand in hand with and funding some of the, the management programs going on. So before um, we get into the life stages of this insect, to really talk uh, quickly too about this pest and why it's of such concern is um, really multifaceted. Uh, the, the insect poses a threat uh, to commercial agriculture. The wine grape industry is really the, uh, the crop and industry we are most concerned about with this pest. Also, possibly tree fruits and others. The forest industry um, is also of concern as this pest will feed on uh, multiple hardwoods like maples and walnut and a few other species. And then this insect will also be a nuisance pest in the home landscape. Um, they are piercing sucking insects that feed on the phloem, uh, drinking 
the sap out of the host plant and excreting lots of honeydew. We will talk about that later as I go through as well. But this is a photo from last week. Um, so this is the life stage we are currently seeing. We um, have seen the insect. They overwinter as egg masses. And these are some egg masses uh, and showing freshly hatched nymphs, um, probably less than a day old. When they first emerge, they're actually bright white with black eyes. Um, kind of unique looking insects as they as they first come out of the eggs and then they start to get this characteristic uh, black coloration with bright white spots and so these are the first instar nymphs the the first juvenile stage and this is what we are are currently seeing still with many eggs hatching out here is a little bit more about those first juvenile stages. The first instar, second instar, and third instar all are black with bright white spots. Um, I often describe it as, as that, as you can see on the photo to the right especially. It's just a really deep black coloration and a brilliant white coloration. And once you can cue into that visual, um, you, you, you can really, really um, confidently identify this insect, I believe. You will notice the, the head projection that they have on these life stages. And uh, during this time, um, they do not fly. They, again, they're immature nymphs. They jump and can jump quite well. Uh, I've seen them from a complete standstill jump nearly six or eight feet. So they have a very wide host range at, at this life stage. Their primary host and favorite host is Tree of Heaven, also uh, an invasive species native to Asia. And they prefer to feed on that much of their, their life stage. But unfortunately, they do not stick to only Tree of Heaven and are known to feed on over 70 other different species. And so um, as we go through and get later in the presentation, we'll talk a little bit more about Tree of Heaven as well. So again, this, this is basically the current life stage, egg masses hatching into the first juvenile uh, nymphs. Second and third are also black and white, and we will be seeing those uh, over the next few weeks um, into, into even June and, and later in June. This is what they do. Um, they often will congregate in large numbers on the, the young tips of, of plants, tender, tender, fresh growing tips of plants is where we will typically see them. Uh, this on the photo on the left, this is a photo I took last year on a wild grapevine. And as you can see on that, on that main shoot of, of new growth, the photo on the right is a young tree of heaven and they're feeding on the leaf petiole there um, on, on all of those as, as tree of heaven is a pinnately compound leaf. So these leaflets here uh, off to either side, this is the main petiole uh, for that leaf. Then at some point in June, we will see the fourth instar show up. Uh, the, the black and white nymphs turn into uh, this fourth and final juvenile stage. It's when they pick up this bright red coloration. They still have the, the black and, and white coloration uh, from the earlier nymphal stages, but this bright red coloration uh, they start showing off at the fourth end star. You can see the center photo, the wing pads really starting to develop um, on either side of the nymph. Again, they do not fly yet um, at this stage, but you can see those wings developing. They are much larger at this time, nearly a half inch or larger in size. 
and um, still really good at jumping and and the red coloration we were talking about we believe is to warn predators um, uh, a predatory defense mechanism that they're picking up again feeding on tree of heaven they're picking up chemicals that uh, that we believe give them uh, a defense to the predators um, much like monarchs may do with milkweed and, and then warn their predators that they do not taste good. The photo on the, the right is the fourth end star feeding actually on a black walnut twig. Uh, it seems at this life stage, they, they very much enjoy black walnut and some of the heaviest infestations we have seen in the Winchester Frederick County area um, have even been on black walnuts during the fourth instar uh, stage of this insect. A few more photos, um, just the various nymphal stages where we can find it. As I said before, over 70 different species and during the juvenile stages, they seem to feed really on, on many different things, often in and around Tree of Heaven Wild grape is another favorite. Virginia creeper is a favorite. Uh, the photo to the left are a few black and white instars on poison ivy. So they will even feed on that. Bush honeysuckle in the center photo. The two photos to the right are both tree of heaven. And then um, sometime in July, we will see the adults emerge and this is what they look like. Several photos here. Many of the photos you may find online, often even in publications and the materials about this insect will show the adult life stage, often with the wings spread wide open, um, showing that, that deep orange reddish underwing coloration. And in, in the natural setting, you rarely see that that bright red uh, coloration unless they are um, flying away or showing a, a defense kind of stance. Um, typically they, they will be like the photo to the left or in the center with the wings folded over their back and um, a little more inconspicuous than you would think. Adult lanternflies are pretty large, uh, over an inch or so. Uh, long, inch and a half maybe, and uh, inch and a half to two inches wide when their wings are, are fully open. Again, a long siphoning mouth part is how they feed. They are piercing, sucking insects. And at this adult stage, um, also you noticed with the previous photo I showed of the fourth instar feeding on the black walnut, they are now feeding really on the stems and even the trunks of trees. They, they are stronger and can feed through the bark, tapping into the phloem and the sap of the host plant. It is at these stages, uh, the adult stage, um, that they really seem to come back to Tree of Heaven and, and really narrow in on feeding heavily on Tree of Heaven and later in the season, we see them move to even maples, red and silver maple particularly. So um, there's still a lot of work going on to understand what, what hosts they prefer and at what life stage, when and why. Uh, I've stated this multiple times, talking about the numerous host plants, black walnut to the left, Actually, I think that's a tree of heaven, sorry, tree of heaven in the center. This photo um, to the right is a, is a young black walnut. Again, th this tree was heavily fed upon by fourth instar nymphs to the point that it was um, causing, causing branch or, or causing the leaves to die and some of the branches, the, the tips to flag. And we've seen that flagging occur here in the Winchester Frederick County area, both on Black Walnut as well as Tree of Heaven. 
um, from, from heavy feeding. Pennsylvania reports after multiple years of heavy feeding, it can even um, lead to tree death of, of some smaller tree of heaven. And here's the um, getting towards kind of the gross factor with this insect. They aggregate in very large numbers and um, the photo to the left is uh, a photo from some residents in Pennsylvania. That is an ornamental cherry tree that they are all feeding on. And again, I don't know many individuals who would be acceptable with this situation. Um, as I said, they're piercing sucking insects and they excrete a lot of honeydew. And so that sticky sugary substance is gonna coat everything uh, underneath that tree where they are, even, even the play equipment, uh, swing set, whatever you have there. Again, becomes quite a nuisance and, and just bothersome um, from that standpoint. Here they are in the top right on wine grapes, uh, again, a photo from Pennsylvania, and this is a major concern with, with the number of insects that can move into a vineyard and feed heavily really all season long. They, they, they like grape uh, as nymphs and also adults and will basically feed from late April, early May when they are hatching out all the way into November when we see killing frosts get rid of the adult population. And so that, that heavy feeding can really um, cut down on the sugars and carbohydrates in, in a, a great plant, a great vine. And that sticky sugary honeydew gets um, uh, excreted and covers everything creating sooty mold, further reducing photosynthesis on the grapevine and uh, can, can lead to vine death. They've certainly reported that in Pennsylvania. Um, some of that I think was coupled with the, the really wet year of 2018, uh, wet feet that grapevines don't like. They were, they were additionally stressed because of that and the feeding of lanternfly, but it all led to um, some significant vine, net, vine death in Pennsylvania following 2018. The photo in the bottom right, again on Tree of Heaven, just showing how they often aggregate and feed together. This is a short video clip. I will probably probably play it multiple times, but really to show you um, what the honeydew can look like, it literally rains down out of trees um, that are heavily infested. So these are Tree of Heaven, this video was taken last fall in Winchester, Virginia, and um, the, the backyard residents of, of several individuals here in Winchester, Frederick County. And you can literally see the honeydew raining down out of the trees here. Um, over 10 streams of honeydew raining down at a single time. Again, I'm playing it again and we'll play it one more time just so that you can see. But if you have trees that are heavily infested in your, in your home landscape, um, tree of heaven, possibly silver maple, birches, willows seem to be trees that we see really high populations in. Uh, you can imagine that this is not an inviting situation, especially if these trees are over your deck or over a driveway. Um, where this coats your vehicles and um, patio areas, things of that nature. It really uh, just becomes an unwelcome situation. I alluded to this before, but that honeydew, as it, uh, as it coats everything, sooty mold begins to grow on it. This black fungal growth that we see coating the leaves and also the, the stems and trunks, even the undergrowth under trees, the, 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 the grass or um, ground cover, whatever is at the base of the tree will, will be covered in this sooty mold growing on honeydew. We also start to see uh, in heavy infestations where there is sap oozing out of the tree trunk because of many puncture wounds um, and that oozing sap and all that honeydew 
will start growing white yeast patches, uh, fungal colonies. You get a vinegar smell and a fermenting yeast smell associated with some of these heavy, heavy population areas as well. A few photos of, of sooty mold. This, this is here in Winchester, Frederick County. Um, kind of an odd phenomenon shown here. It seems uh, some snails had fed upon that sooty mold and, and cleaned it off. Um, those are the same, the same trees, same leaves. So interesting thing to look out for. Also, if, if that wasn't enough, um, with that sticky sugary substance, we often find uh, many other insects attracted to the honeydew and the oozing sap, many um, ants, bees, hornets, wasps, even butterflies attracted to feed uh, on that as a food source. And the photo on the left I know is not a great quality photo, but I put it in there just to talk about a individual experience. Um, I was contacted last year by a beekeeper who had visited a site. The homeowner reached out to them stating that they had a honeybee swarm in a tree and the beekeeper came, inspected the tree and said, no ma'am, you do not have a honeybee swarm, you have a lanternfly infestation. And that's what, these are tree of heaven, heavily infested with, with hundreds of lanternflies. Uh, the red circles are around honeybees and bumblebees that were being attracted to this tree. Again, literally hundreds of them up in the canopy. Um, you can see that white yeasty uh, fungal growth occurring at the base of the tree. And so this was just a small backyard in the city of Winchester, um, young family with kids and, and dogs and cats. And it's just not a welcome situation when, when it gets to this level. The photo on the right is a photo I took up in Pennsylvania two years ago when we, we visited some sites up there. But as you can see, a yellow jacket is hanging around looking uh, for some honeydew to feed on. Then the egg mass life stage is, um, as I said, the overwintering life stage. This, uh, the adult females will begin to deposit egg masses in the fall, September, mid-September timeframe is what we have been seeing here in Virginia as well as in Pennsylvania. And um, probably one of the hardest life stages to really identify and see and be clear on. Um, they lay rows of eggs. Um, you can actually see some of those eggs laid in rows here. This is an old egg mass that has actually hatched out. You can see slits there. And then once the egg mass is laid, the female will typically coat it with a covering. Um, it looks much like a smear of mud or putty uh, can be varied in color. When it first is put down, it's a bright, brilliant white, and within the first day or so, as it's drying, it turns um, gray or tan, off-white. Uh, again, numerous colorations we will see out there. The, the fresher egg masses, like this one here that I'm circling to the top left by the penny, uh, they're often shiny and um, kind of have that really smooth looking surface as they dry out and age. Uh, they, they, again, just look more like a mud smear. As you see here on the bottom right, this, this is in Frederick County on an abandoned tractor trailer. And um, for some reason, they, they seem to often uh, lay their egg masses on rusty metal. Pennsylvania has reported that now multiple years that, that they, they find them on many, many metal objects and we are seeing that too here in Virginia. Typically, um, the egg masses are found up in the canopy of the tree uh, on the underside branches and sometimes protected areas. This was a cut 
a limb off of a cherry tree that had egg masses. You can see four fairly fresh egg masses. This one on the far left is an egg mass from the previous year with the open slits where they hatched out. Again, some more photos of egg masses on undersides of branches, typically even on small twigs. As the population grows, it seems um, they're really just looking for square footage to lay the egg masses and um, you will start to see more down the trunk of the tree. Some studies done in Pennsylvania show that about one third of the egg masses are showing up in, in the first three meters of, of the tree. So really within human height, we're only able to reach about a third of the egg masses, maybe less. Another photo or a couple photos showing what these egg masses look like. Again, they can be um, easily confused, even with things like lichen, um, Carolina mantis, Uthicas or egg masses. And uh, you can see on their two different egg masses here on this piece of bark. And, and as they dry and crack, they, they weather and really blend in fairly well. Talking about some non plant host sites that we've seen them on, concrete, rocks, things of that nature. Rock is believed to be the pathway from Asia to Pennsylvania egg masses on ornamental landscaping stone. We believe that same pathway is likely how it arrived to Virginia in the Frederick County area um, from, from Berks County, Pennsylvania. So again, this is, this is part of the concern with this insect is its, its ability to move around with human-aided assistance. Showing how the egg mass progresses from the fall to the spring. Here you can see some egg masses actually, or, or eggs laid in rows that did not actually get covered completely. Uh, but this photo shows age progression as that, that coating kind of dries and cracks and starts to flake off in the spring. A uh, listing of what we've seen, I'm, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this photo uh, and this slide, but these are host plants that we've identified so far in Virginia. And the E shows where we have seen egg masses. But again, it really shows the wide range of, of host species that we've seen them on. Many invasives, many uh, undesirable plants, but also, uh, as I've said before, forest plants like uh, tree of, um, like black walnut and maples, uh, wild grape, and we know they like wine grapes um, and other ag crops. Quite a few in the home landscape that would be considered ornamentals like hollies and uh, possibly silver maple, red maple, honey locust, and willows. So again, all, all aspects of, of human, um, human life can really be impacted by this insect. Uh, the ag setting, as we've talked about, wine grapes is our greatest concern. Thankfully to date, we have not yet seen this insect in commercial ag production uh, areas in Virginia. We're right on the borders of some apple orchards and closely watching to see what happens. Um, but the areas of infestation here in Virginia have largely been residential and industrial. So I said that it impacts agriculture, forest, the home landscape. It also impacts industry because of the quarantine and the rules, regulations, additional time that it, it uh, requires industry and commercial commerce to, to take care and make sure they're not transporting this insect around elsewhere. So Virginia Cooperative Extension, again, uh, Eric Day in the Insect ID Lab, um, along with Tree, his technician there in the lab, Doug Pfeiffer, uh, who is our fruit entomologist on campus in Blacksburg, and others have been working uh, very hard to get many publications, many resources available to us. And uh, 
if you do an online search for Spotted Lanternfly Virginia or Spotted Lanternfly Virginia Tech, it will take you to this main uh, ext.vt.edu Spotted Lanternfly page. There are a host of resources there. Also, a portal there to uh, report a find of an insect that is really a call to action that we are asking of people all over the state if you find this insect please report it and we want to know where where it's showing up um, i didn't sm spend much time on it on that that map i showed at the beginning of the presentation of the mid-atlantic and new england there were dots on counties that that had other transportation intercepts so it has been found well beyond the the infestation areas and uh, transportation intercepts have been found even here in Virginia in uh, Fauquier County and also Madison picked up in uh, as dead dead adults in in commerce goods we've got wallet cards available um, at, at some point when we get back to normal and uh, are not um, dealing with the COVID-19 situation. Uh, these are great handouts for many of our plant clinics and um, other festivals and things that, that we often attend as agents and master gardeners. And um, since I did mention COVID, the, I will say um, quite a lot of hysteria and attention was given to spotted lanternfly and certainly with the the coronavirus we have seen that attention um, rapidly uh, move elsewhere and um, just sort of the nature of, of, of current media and what is going on and, and certainly the life-threatening situation that that has been posed by that this photo um, or shot of a of a map again i don't expect you to understand this but it's covering much of the city of winchester into frederick county and this is showing um, some of the treatment areas that are are being managed by virginia department of ag in hand with united states department of ag um, it's really just a slide to remind me to talk about the program that they have been doing so what they are doing, it's a voluntary program. Uh, they go to the landowners in the infestation area, ask for permission um, to work and treat in, in these property areas. They identify Tree of Heaven. If Tree of Heaven are on the property, they are treating smaller diameter trees with herbicide. Uh, it was Garlon. I think now it's a different Triclopyr product but they are trying to kill and reduce the number of tree of heaven in, in the infestation area. And so smaller tree of heaven, smaller than six inches in diameter at breast height are being treated with a basal bark application or a hack and squirt application of herbicide. Larger tree of heaven are being treated with dinotefuron. That's a systemic insecticide and that too is going on as a basal bark application, really just to the trunk of the tree at human height. And um, that insecticide then is taken up by the tree and translocated all throughout, uh, targeting fourth instar nymphs and adult lanternflies that may be feeding on that tree of heaven. So a very targeted application only to the trunks of tree of heaven is the management plan that, that Virginia Department of Ag and um, USDA are working on. And as we've seen the population expand, as we've seen uh, funds dry up again because of coronavirus, it will be all, all the more um, imperative that landowners within the infestation area also help with the management of this insect um, because funds are gonna rapidly be spread then. The Pest Management Guide, PMG, for Home and Grounds um, 2020 version. This is a screenshot of what's listed in there as management options, uh, some insecticides there, and links to other resources uh, that I've already noted. But that is there. That's going to really be pertinent only to 
uh, Winchester, Frederick County, and Clark County at this time where we have known infestation. Anybody beyond that area, and even if you're within the known infestation, we are happy to have you report findings of spotted lanternfly so that we can monitor its spread and so we can also see where there are hot spots and report those to Virginia Department of Ag um, so that they know how to target some of the treatments that they are doing. Some great fact sheets that, that Eric Day, Doug Pfeiffer, Andy DeShane, who's a master's student in entomology at Virginia Tech have put together uh, residential control for spotted lanternfly. You can find that on the links um, that I've mentioned as well. Here's the reporting portal online through e-extension that Eric Day put together. Uh, again, an opportunity to report an insect um, if you find it and can give a photo, the address of the location found, uh, all of that is very helpful. It's an easy insect to typically confirm over a photo. So uh, we would ask that you try to get a photo if you can. Um, even if you've completely smashed the insect before you take the photo, that, that's, that's quite okay. So that's kind of our, our plea with this insect. And I'm gonna switch gears and talk just a little bit about uh, Tree of Heaven real quickly and go through some slides of that because that is the primary host of this insect. These are all some adult female trees. It is an invasive weed species, as I mentioned before, from Asia. It, it will grow really in any uh, disturbed soil area. We often find it lining the interstate and roadway systems here in Virginia and the Mid-Atlantic, up and down Interstate I-81, which dissects Winchester and Frederick County. Um, can even see it growing out of the side of buildings and rock walls sometimes. Recognizing the tree, here are some more photos. Um, this is, we've, we've been seeing this stage in the top right, them budding out, that new foliage emerging often has a bronze, um, orange, reddish uh, kind of uh, coloration to it as it fully leaves out and matures. It, it has a yellow green coloration. Again, I mentioned it is a pinnately compound leaf. So this is one single leaf here to the left um, with numerous leaflets on that, that one leaf. And uh, you can see some of the, the seeds on the tree in the photo bottom right. Again, showing the leaflet. And one of the distinguishing characteristics of this uh, from some of the lookalikes like sumac or um, ash or walnut is to turn that leaflet over and look at the base of it where the, the leaflet joins the, the main petiole or stem of the leaf. And you will often see um, uh, these pores at the, at the base on these small lobes. And that's an easy distinguishing characteristic to positively identify tree of heaven. Also, uh, many, many recognize the smell of this. If you break and crush a stem or leaf, uh, there's quite a pungent smell associated with tree of heaven that, that can help you identify as well. The bark here is a mature tree to the right. Um, a younger branch to the left. You see many lenticels on this younger branch. The bud scars um, are visible here where my cursor is pointing, another one down in the bottom left. On even younger shoots, uh, they have really large bud scars. Uh, that too can be a helpful identification tool. As they age, they get kind of this reptilian alligator looking um, uh, bark characteristic and uh, a smooth bark typically. More photos showing, showing the flowers, showing um, the seed pods, samaras of, of Tree of Heaven. We would encourage landowners to, to work at removing Tree of Heaven on your property. 
especially focusing in on the females that may be producing seeds so that you're reducing the number um, of seeds and potential new trees in the landscape, um, possibly leaving one or a few uh, adult males as a trap tree should the insect arrive. Um, you may be able to use that as a trap tree uh, to spray or monitor. Um, Tree of Heaven is one, as I said, with the plan with VDAX and USDA, they are using herbicides to kill. We would not recommend just mowing this off or cutting it down because that will cause many suckers to come from the cut stump and also the root system, and you will turn one into many more um, if, you, if you do it without herbicides. Some quick look-alikes, sumac. Um, they do not have a smooth or entire leaf, very serrated. So uh, an easy way to see and, and look at that up close is the serrations on sumac. Um, but this is a, often confused with, with tree of heaven. In my area of the state, many people will call tree of heaven shumac. Um, and, and they're referring to tree of heaven. This is the photos I'm showing now are of sumac. So, so there is some kind of name confusion with these two plants and uh, often have to spend some time trying to, to tease that out and distinguish the two. Showing, showing the, the seeds of Tree of Heaven on the left, the seeds of sumac to the right. And then just real quick, I'm gonna talk about volunteer banding. We've been doing the past two years and hope to kick off again this year, but with COVID-19 that has delayed and altered our plans and, and supplies are still locked up on campus and we, we really are still having trouble getting those out. And to the, the potential volunteers all over the state, um, but we are asking for help to, to monitor and look for this insect and make sure we get early detection if it shows up elsewhere. Um, banding with sticky bands, as the nymphs often fall out and jump out of the tree and then climb back up the trunks of, of trees is an easy way to identify low populations of this insect. So we've been having volunteers um, for the past two years do this in their areas on their own property or sometimes in conjunction with uh, state or county owned property if they're working with uh, state or county officials um, with their permission. We're not encouraging people to just go out and start doing this on property without permission um, as again a positive find would likely create some regulatory action and potential quarantine. The nymphs will often show up at the base of the tree as they're climbing back up. Uh, these are showing first through third nymphal stages. Fourth instar, again, also often trapped on these sticky bands. And then uh, we've asked the volunteers to report into a portal uh, every two weeks and then we develop and, and that gives us a map. So this is a map from a previous year showing all the blacks are negatives where, where fines and bans and volunteers were looking throughout the state. Thankfully, all the positives um, are in the known infestation area up in Winchester, Frederick County and just into the, the western parts of Clark County. A big downside that I will mention to this, this banding method and um, the United States Department of Ag Appalachian Fruit Research Station here, uh, just within 30 minutes of me in Winchester, they're in Kearneysville, West Virginia. Um, they are doing a lot of work at looking at other trapping methods and trying to come up with uh, uh, some alternatives because we end up with a lot of a lot of bycatch with the sticky bands. Um, they get bad publicity as well because you start uh, or have the potential to catch um, birds, squirrel tails and fur, uh, small reptiles, and, and again, many, many non-target insect species. So um, we have, have worked to try to uh, 
push our banding and monitoring program. And this year we're gonna deploy more circle traps. This is showing a photo of me and Dr. Pfeiffer looking at a circle, tra circle trap that, that Eric Day had deployed here in, in Frederick County. Um, another photo of the circle trap and the USDA that I mentioned, uh, Tracy Lesky's lab is looking at a modified trap. This is the, the regular circle trap, but they're looking at a modified circle trap with a much larger cup uh, and container at the top because this one will have to be modified to allow larger nymphal stages to, to get into that, that container. So that takes me to the end of my presentation. Um, I'll let Kathleen open it up. I have not been watching the, the chat box. So let's, let's see what questions you guys have. Great, thank you so much, Mark. Um, we've had a few questions. So if anybody has any others, please type them into the chat box now as we wrap up our webinar. Um, one of them is, could you repeat when the adults typically emerge, when, we'll, when we will see adults during the year? Sure, so we typically see first adults showing up mid-July. Great. It will, they will, that's the life stage that we see all the way into October, November, possibly even early December if we have a mild, a mild fall. Okay, another quick question. Um, you had mentioned um, it's attracted to maple species. Does that include Japanese maples? Good question. I have seen a, I have seen an egg mass or a few egg masses on a blood good maple. Um, I have closely been watching some Japanese, um, the lace leaf Japanese maples and not really seen them feeding on that. Um, it's yet to be fully understood. Um, but as far as maple species, we typically see them on silver maple, red maple, also uh, box elder maple is, is another species that we will commonly find them on. Not as much sugar, some on Norway, uh, just, just from anecdotal observations. Thanks, Mark. Um, another question just came in, is spotted lanternfly a pest in its natural environment? That's a great question. And so, yes, it is. Um, in Asia, they report it as a pest uh, in the forest land. They also report it as a pest to grapes, a pest to peaches. Um, but in Asia, there are some natural enemies that have, um, you know, co-evolved with this insect. Uh, some of those species are being looked at in quarantine here by the USDA in, in the United States. Uh, they are several species of parasitoid wasps. One, one will attack the egg mass and, and lay its eggs in the egg of the spotted lanternfly. Another will actually attack the nymphs and lay eggs in the nymph and then grow out of the nymph as a, as a mature wasp. Um, another point of potential natural biological control that we are seeing, because here in the US, we do not have any natural um, predators that, that really hone in and specify to lanternfly. Um, we will see things like spiders, uh, ants, wheel bugs, praying mantis, and others feed on them, but not in any, um, any level that would actually control or, or add to the management that, that we see in these heavy, heavy aggregation and heavy population areas. Uh, but in 2018, the wet year that we had, we've also seen it some, uh, we believe here in the Winchester area, Pennsylvania reported two naturally occurring fungi one is Bavaria bassiana, which is a entomopathogenic fungus that, that will, will attack and, and kill uh, insects. So that is a commercially available uh, biological control. And that has been, been studied some in Pennsylvania. Virginia Department of Ag has tried it out a little bit here in the Winchester, Frederick County area. Um, they are also looking at uh, some oil sprays and other sprays that may be effective on egg masses. 
Um, Pennsylvania has done a lot of efficacy trials, but we are still learning. Um, it's truly been a group effort, a team effort by uh, the USDA, by the state departments of agriculture and all the states impacted and beyond. Uh, also with the, the extension programs and the land grant universities, uh, the, the research side of USDA, Department of Forestry, even Virginia Department of Transportation helping out in some aspects. Um, so it's, it truly is a, a team effort um, and it's gonna require the landowners and individuals, community members um, to jump on board to and, and help with, with managing this insect. All right. Have you found that dormant oil is successful in dealing with egg masses? Um, good question. What, what Virginia Department of Ag has been applying um, and the efficacy trials out of Penn State have been um, soybean oil, I believe, um, at higher concentrations uh, of, of those products. So it requires a pretty high concentration of that oil to actually coat and, and kill the egg masses. So that's, that's still being worked through and some regulatory uh, issues with the label and, and it being labeled, you know, that, that's also the thing with, with a new invasive, it's not, it's not gonna be listed as a host on, on many of our, our pesticide labels. All right, um, this comment is petroleum in a two to three percent concentration. Has that been tried? No, much. It's it's been much higher than that. And higher than the two to three percent. Yes. All right. If there's any last questions, feel free to type them into the chat box. Um, if not, Mark, thanks so much for your time this morning. This has been a really informative presentation, um, and I hope you have all enjoyed it. If you'd like to share it, it should be in our webinar archive within the next week or so. Um, I typed that right at the beginning of the chat box so you can scroll up and access that website directly. Um, so again, thank you, Mark. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Kathleen.